Humberto Schubert Coelho, by SSL, London. Well, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, I'm very uh, honored uh, with the possibility of talking a little bit about our recent published book on the science of life after death. Well, uh, I am Humberto Coelho. I am a philosophy lecturer at the Department of Philosophy at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. Uh, and about two weeks ago, I and two psychiatrists, two, two colleagues, published a book on the available evidence on uh, the possibility of the survival of consciousness after the destruction uh, and the death of the body. This is uh, usually uh, considered a religious subject and we ignored this very common belief and, and prejudice and tried to address the subject from a purely academic, scientific or philosophical perspective. Since I am a philosopher and my colleagues are psychiatrists, I uh, invested more time or I dedicated myself more to historical and philosophical uh, aspects of the problem. Uh, from the historical point of view, the issue is already very interesting because there is no single culture on the planet Earth that ignores the possibility of an afterlife. In fact, uh, we never encounter a materialistic culture among primitive uh, communities. Materialism is a development of a more recent culture and we can spot in pretty much every primitive community uh, an immediate and uh, almost take for granted belief in, in the immortality of the soul of course in many forms and although this is only an anthropological or historical observation it also helps to uh, justify or to fundament the first strong philosophical argument in favor of the possibility of an afterlife. It seems to be a rational and also a very natural thought to human beings. Human beings everywhere, in every uh, apes and, and uh, cultures, in, in pretty much all times, believed in the immortality of the soul in many forms. I was just reading when I was uh, at this conference at the University of, of Oxford, I was uh, in the Chinese center where they have a quite uh, interesting library on Taoism, Confucianism and other uh, aspects of Chinese culture. And just as, as a curiosity, great Chinese sages and philosophers preached in the past the immortality of the body. So there would be an alchemical or some sort of magical way to grant the immortality of the body. And these sages, already very civilized in a very learned society, they believe that the immortality of the soul would be a sort of superstition. So we can uh, connect or make an analogy with many learned, many uh, academics and learned uh, people today who believe that the immortality of the body would be more uh, possible or uh, a more rational possibility, a, a more sustainable possibility than the immortality of the soul. But uh, no primitive culture ever believed that. No primitive culture ever, ever believed something of the like. In fact, 
this is a byproduct of civilization. Uh, before the development of, of culture in a more refined and urban and learned society, people always believed and they always had uh, the conviction or they were persuaded that they had evidence in dreams or through apparitions, hearings, many sort of uh, spiritual phenomena which are consistent among uh, all populations in the world, they pretty much believed that the immortality of the spirit or the soul was a relatively obvious thing, mm -hmm. an obvious aspect of, of, of nature and life. Uh, with the development of civilized life, so to say, some people uh, cutted the bounds with this uh, original tradition, this very uh, natural human thoughts, and try to project new forms, um, more materialistic forms, to understand the possibility of the continuation of life. So, just as, as a passing curiosity, uh, materialism is not a product of Western society specifically, we can find materialistic doctrines among the ancient Indians and also among uh, some Chinese sages of the past. So materialism it exists philosophically, but it uh, arises or it, it only uh, happens and, and develop roots in a more or less developed society. Now, we can make different interpretations of that. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example, a philosopher uh, that inspired the, the Romanticism, believed that uh, the, the natural thoughts primitive societies have in a closer contact with nature, they have a tendency to be more immediate, less abstract, and therefore closer to the truth. So in that perspective, the development of learning and, and civilization is not necessarily connected to, to truth, as we sometimes believe. But this is uh, just a, a, a curiosity that could be added to, to the subject. Historically, uh, it is also relevant to, to see and to, to notice that the conceptions of afterlife among cultures are also quite similar, more than people would usually admit. Uh, if you ask the, the specialists, the academics about different concepts of afterlife or this different concepts of the soul among cultures, they would usually answer that uh, they are quite different and the, the Western understanding of hell and heaven does not correspond to the Chinese uh, Taoist or Confucianist understanding or that the Western concept of God, including the, the Muslim uh, traditions, uh, also even Hinduistic conceptions of, of God, uh, have no correspondence in Buddhism, for example. But when we dig just a bit further, we will see that this uh, extreme difference do not actually happen in practice. People in general believe uh, in a source of light and uh, reason, order, moral order, good in the cosmos and they also naturally have some sort of general understanding about the continuation of human personality and human consciousness after death. Uh, again to, to give uh, just a, an example as a curiosity, 
many Buddhist scholars and also Taoist scholars who are uh, committed to uh, debunking the connections and the analogies with Western philosophy and Western religions, they emphasize very frequently that uh, Buddhists do not believe in an afterlife. Buddhists do not believe or Taoists do not believe in heaven and hell. But uh, a bit further, when the same authors are speaking about mediums or speaking about dreams or about uh, ancestral worship, they say, well, we expect our ancestors to reincarnate, we expect to meet our ancestors when we die, after we die, and so on and so on. So in practice, the same people who would deny the idea of an afterlife of, or, or of an immortal soul would uh, say that people expect this and that Taoism uh, or Buddhism does have a place for uh, this expectation or uh, for this existential concern. Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest problem in the general discussion about afterlife is that people do not get along or do not agree much uh, on terminology but uh, when you dig just a little bit more in the subject you realize that they quite uh, a lot agree on the actual expectations and the actual beliefs of people and especially they pretty much agree about the phenomenon the evidence that uh, is presented in pretty much every culture, in every religion. Well, uh, the book deals with that evidence and I, I just started with the historical or anthropological perspective to give you the, the, the big picture, but uh, in the chapter that deals with evidence, we will scrutinize available evidence for um, near-death experiences or provided by near-death experiences which is maybe the most shocking evidence and the, also the most widespread and then there is a mediumship and also a, a quite ignored, neglected subject in academic life almost a, a taboo that is uh, slowly imposing itself to research, to scientific research. Again, we will find now anthropological books describing mediumship in all cultures, in Japanese culture, in Korean culture, in India, in China, in Africa. Uh, it's pretty universal phenomena, uh, but uh, despite the fact that uh, it, it's quite universal anthropologically, there is also a, a significant difficulty uh, from the psychological perspective and even from the philosophical and theological research to deal with uh, this phenomenon. Well, and the third... Uh, oh, very welcome. <laughs> The third class of phenomena we uh, worked uh, on was um, alleged memories of past lives in children. Now, we all know that uh, Jan Stevenson, the American child psychiatrist, is the leading name in the field, pretty much created the, the research that uh, is now repeated in Iceland and the US and in Brazil, in India and in many other countries. Uh, and we do have new evidence, significant evidence in the last years, especially uh, from, from uh, America and, and, and Iceland. Uh, and the, the evidence suggests that some of the claims 
these young, very young children make cannot be explained um, by a, a better hypothesis than the hypothesis that these children do have exact knowledge about a previous personality, about the life and the, the, the facts that surround that are uh, uh, closed uh, or related to, to this previous personality. So, uh, when we sum the three types of evidence, it is quite difficult to dismiss the possibility that something or somehow our consciousness has access to uh, ideas, beliefs, thoughts and especially knowledge that uh, we should not have without the survival of the spirit or soul after bodily death. Now, uh, of course we have criticism uh, on this uh, evidence and we also have um, the, the common charges from materialist researchers that uh, this uh, is a priori impossible because uh, evidence for something that contradicts materialistic uh, theories could not exist that, that could not be such uh, evidence but then we had to deal in, in a whole chapter with these uh, presumptions, the, with these presuppositions and uh, try to deconstruct them as essentially dogmatic. So, uh, science uh, has no necessary commitment to materialism. Materialism is a philosophical position. Physicalism, which is the name uh, that uh, materialism receives in, in more recent decades in, in academic research uh, is also a philosophical position. It, as a philosophical position, uh, pretty much as spiritualism, it is an interpretation of the evidence provided by science. So science cannot be materialistic or spiritualistic, science has to be skeptic and to address the phenomena, the evidence and uh, scrutinize what nature is telling us about uh, every aspect of, of uh, itself, of every aspect of the natural Without world. Without a label. Exactly. The labels are philosophical. Now, many people will claim uh, that uh, everyone has a philosophical position too. Everyone is more materialistic or more spiritualistic. And that is correct. This is a very correct claim because, in fact, no one uh, is absent of a philosophical position. There is no single human being without a philosophical position because philosophical positions are the way we interpret nature and life so we may not know which philosophy we have and support but we all have an interpretation of life an interpretation of the world and uh, an interpretation of the ultimate meaning of uh, world and reality and our life uh, in it. So, um, because we all have philosophies, even uh, not knowing about them, uh, scientists, of course, as, uh, as much as they are humans, they do have uh, a tendency to materialism or to spiritualism. Uh, we mistakenly assume that scientists are in general materialists, but in fact, uh, surveys show that the majority of scientists 
in the US, the best service are uh, in the US uh, still. The majority of scientists believe in God and a significant number, more than half the scientists, believe in the possibility of an afterlife. Believe that it is at least a possibility. Uh, the problem is that in media and in, in more popular books of uh, scientific uh, propaganda or the, 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 the basic uh, narratives that uh, are culturally constructed to uh, emphasize or to support uh, a more uh, generalized education uh, for the scientific uh, method or for the scientific vision of the world, it is common to see uh, claims that reflect materialistic positions from the authors and they are assumed to be scientific. They are assumed to be scientific positions, while in fact it is not only uh, impossible, but it is a consequence of a certain ignorance about the boundaries between science and philosophy and also religion this is a further problem on the other hand we also have prejudice from religious traditions and doctrines that uh, presuppose they can tell us exactly how afterlife should happen so religious doctrines religions in general when they have a vision about afterlife they deny the evidence, they uh, deny the possibility of scientific research on uh, such issues uh, related to the afterlife because revelation, secret books, doctrine, uh, church fathers, uh, great uh, interpreters, no matter if it's in, in, in Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or whatever, they are uh, unquestionable authorities and based on the vision that this religious man or prophets or, or the sacred books are unquestionable authorities, uh, the possibility of investigating it impartially, rationally and scientifically is also a priori denied. A priori is before experience, before we uh, have a real experience with, with it, uh, it is denied uh, in, in an abstract manner. Well, then uh, we have a, a great challenge in research on life after death. From one perspective, we have to deal with materialistic dogmas in, in universities, in academic life, also in culture and media that believe that the philosophical positions associated uh, to materialism are actually scientific and non-philosophical and on the other hand we have religious dogmas and religious sort of prohibitions uh, to investigate the, the, the given evidence. So uh, that's why we needed a philosophical discussion before entering the, the proper evidence on, on science uh, on after that, on, on afterlife, sorry. Uh, well, that's why I brought this book here. Unfortunately, it is only in Portuguese, I hope someone uh, assumed the, the challenge of translating it to English and, and offering it to a more broader audience but uh, this book is uh, close related to, to this subject from a more historical philosophical perspective uh, it's called a uh, history of religious freedom and it analyzes the development of uh, religious freedom in the West, particularly, uh, which, which was pretty much uh, 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 the, 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 the original source of religious freedom, 
and then spread throughout the world in, in modern societies, in democratic societies. And uh, our modern ideas of uh, individual freedom or individualism, liberalism, in the more positive sense of these words, not in political or economical sense, the idea of individual freedom, that individuals should not be controlled or um, co-opted by uh, institutions and, and society, the idea of uh, equality, the idea of diversity, that every position, every group of thought should be respected, should be heard, should have the right to express and to manifest itself, this idea was created. It wasn't a natural idea. It did not develop naturally in all cultures and all countries as the idea of the immortality of the soul did. So uh, liberty, freedom was uh, a concept invented in the Renaissance in Europe specifically, in especially in Christian culture, in the clash with dissent, Judaism, Islam, and uh, the, the recent or the, 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 the recent born uh, atheism. Uh, how did it happen, and why is it relevant for research in religion in general? Well, um, in ancient times, in, in the ancient world, or also in the Middle Ages, across cultures and religion, uh, without much distinction, we have the general idea that uh, orthodoxy, or the correct interpretation of scripture, the correct interpretation of the prophets, should not be questioned. Because the, 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 the very definition of orthodoxy is that it is the correct interpretation of scripture and, and religious tradition. But uh, the official interpretation is not necessarily the original meaning of Buddha, Jesus or Muhammad, for example. And therefore, uh, philosophers all, always claim that uh, the, the justification for orthodoxy was insufficient or even irrational. Instead of orthodoxy, we should philosophically, we should be free to question and to uh, create conflicting and, and diversified interpretations of the religious sources and that would be a more rational way to to deal with uh, revelation and and the, the original sources of religion now uh, from that struggle protestant reform was originated and reform in general we, we Sometimes we believe that reform, reformation is essentially Protestant, but there were also Catholic reformers, important Catholic reformers, such as Erasmus of Rotterdam. Um, Thomas More, a famous uh, Englishman. Uh, and the reformation, reformators and, and reformation in general uh, try to cut the connection with Catholic tradition and orthodoxy and create a new space for the free interpretation of scripture. Without free interpretation of scripture, other aspects of our behavior and even of our thoughts would be still controlled or somehow shaped by the way orthodoxy interpreted religious sources and, and, and scripture, then uh, we usually believe that political freedom was the source of religious freedom, while in fact it is exactly the opposite. First we had religious freedom, 
and based on religious freedom, people started uh, advocating for uh, social, political, economic freedoms. So the, the, the freedoms we enjoy now in the democratic world, they are only possible because first we had the right to preach, to worship, to uh, develop our thoughts on religion and on revelation the way we wanted, more individually. Um, ironically, five or, or six hundred years after this historical development, we live in an extremely free society. We are pretty much masters of our personal behavior. We are pretty much masters of our thoughts as individuals, but religious traditions and also dogmatic materialism uh, s still work as structures that prevent people from having new and uh, more diversified interpretations on some subjects. That's one main reason why it is so difficult to make research on afterlife or make research on the already available evidence uh, of uh, the survival of the spirit after bodily death. So, do you have uh, questions or can I explore um, one of these elements or aspects specifically? Yeah, I don't know if he's entirely in the side of your subject that is more academic, but as we are uh, philosophy, uh, spiritual science or something like that, and moral uh, teachings, that is our tripod, spiritism, and we are so happy because in these two years, so two years and a half of a pandemic, we noticed that people from um, um, Muslim people, yeah? mm -hmm. Muslim, and Shintoist, they approach to SSL, to spiritism, so they know that we are not crashing with their religion. They are their religion, their mosquitoes or uh, mosques, etc. But they are still coming and enjoying and studying with us. One of them apolo apologized because he's not here now, because he, he is far from here, mm -hmm. was um, wondering to, to, to listen to you. Yeah. But it was impossible to come, so he was watching probably now. Yeah? Amazing. That's a great point, Elsa, because uh, originally uh, modern spiritualism was uh, not a religion. So it, it was an independent way of thinking, a, a philosophy or a scientific exploration of similar evidence we are dealing with in, in our book. And we, we had even some famous uh, Catholics, Protestants, uh, and, and people from all the other religions too, engaged in modern spiritualism and also in, in spiritism. We can give example of a uh, famous Lutheran pastor in, in Denmark, Martensen, and uh, here in England, famous Anglican reverend, Stanton Moses, who was also a, a remarkable medium and, and produced himself uh, significant evidence. Well, uh, there is no contradiction or no impediment uh, for a person to be a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew uh, or a non-religious person and a spiritist because spiritism is, is, is not a... Uh, a religious uh, doctrine or a religious revelation in the theological sense. So from the theological perspective uh, there is no orthodoxy or no doctrine or no tradition that cannot be changed. In fact, uh, if I'm not wrong, the founder of Spiritism say that every point of doctrine uh, was only actual, was only uh, the, the momentary stage of uh, spiritist thought. And if science 
uh, advanced. advanced in a certain way that would neglect a specific element in spiritism, spiritism should adapt itself to the scientific advance. Well, uh, considering this, uh, it is hard to uh, to classify spiritism as a religion. And I think there are some key advantages in not classifying it as a religion, uh, especially with an orthodoxy in the very traditional sense. Uh, by not being a religion, uh, spiritism is, is free to uh, engage in productive dialogue with science and, and philosophy uh, without uh, any previous bias or any previous uh, presuppositions that uh, it has to, to enforce. Now, this is also not to, to say that religions, in a more traditional sense, cannot uh, have a productive uh, relationship and, and, and cannot be engaged in, in such a research. In fact, many, uh, many relevant researchers in the field were religious people. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Jan Stevenson was uh, a Protestant believer and we have a significant number of uh, people uh, connected to, to religion in, in many different forms uh, and I, I just quoted in the beginning some uh, books on Chinese traditions and Japanese traditions that uh, explore mediumship in, in, in their cultures uh, from the Taoist or from the Buddhist perspective. What is interesting from the scientific point of view and also philosophically uh, exciting is that when you read the reports of mediumship in China or in, in uh, West Africa or in, in spiritism or in modern spiritualism or in shamanism they are quite similar they are shockingly similar which should not be the case if they were culture oriented. So at least from a more materialistic perspective, at least we need a neurological explanation or an evolutionary explanation for uh, why this supposedly, uh, supposed uh, hallucinations happen almost exactly the same way across cultures. Mm. Very interesting. Einstein always reassured that he believed in God, always mm -hmm. quoted God in many of his discoveries and um, evidences. I don't know how yes. often, but he always did. Yes, yeah. uh, I explore the historical relations between science and religion more in, in this previous book, mm -hmm. uh, published also this year uh, uh, by um, a famous Catholic publisher in, in, in Brazil, uh, which, which is very open to, to a, a broader debate on, on philosophy and, and science in uh, relation uh, with religion. Well, uh, pretty much every great scientist in history was religious yeah. or was at least spiritual in some sense. So the founder of calculus, Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, the founder of, of, of chemistry, one of the most important scientists of all, all time, uh, Robert Boyle, uh, even uh, believed in telepathy and uh, the possibility of scientifically investigating ghost apparitions and uh, the survival of the soul after bodily death. Uh, Isaac Newton was uh, not only considered one of the greatest scientists of all time, maybe the greatest scientist of all time, 
but also wrote more on the Bible and on uh, uh, biblical and, and, and theological issues than uh, on science itself. Uh, Francis Bacon uh, and uh, René Descartes, who are the, the founders of scientific method and, and created the way we, we do science uh, to these days, uh, with, of course, a great development after that. Uh, they believed their works were uh, inspired by God. Francis Bacon believed that science uh, well, uh, Francis Bacon believed that science uh, was uh, uh, the destination of humanity given by the Genesis. Because in the Genesis it is said that uh, humans uh, uh, shall uh, uh, work uh, on earth as, as stewards of, of the entire creation. René Descartes uh, who uh, developed a significant uh, part of, of mathematics and also philosophy and was one of the fathers of scientific method uh, based his philosophy uh, on dreams uh, that gave him the urge to produce a, a radical revolution, revolutionary change in philosophy because he believed to be called by God uh, to do that. Uh, Maxwell, also the, the, the famous British uh, founder of electromagnetism already in the 19th century, was not only religious, a Christian, but also uh, had uh, romantic ideas, that is, uh, uh, ideas about uh, human magnetism and uh, possibility of uh, a spiritual connection between people. Uh, the same is also true for Faraday, mm -hmm. the father of uh, electricity, you know, what, what important uh, uh, scientist of, of electricity. electricity. Uh, Benjamin Franklin also. Pasteur believed that uh, as we dig deeper and deeper in, in, in science, we lose uh, conviction in materialism and find ourselves encountering a supreme order and a supreme intelligence in, uh, in nature. Well, uh, Humberto, as we, as Espiritists, the ones that we are studying, reading, knowing more deeply, especially a book Genesis, eh? that it was a scientific book, really good. Uh, all the books are good, of course. Uh, why, as we have this wonderful source of uh, freedom and understanding in our hands, why is so difficult to introduce more and more and more into countries or people's mm -hmm. minds, etc.? Because I have friends here. Yeah, and th th that's an interesting thing. Sometimes a, a possible answer is that it is not that difficult, you know. Uh, sometimes the way we do it is not the way people want to, to hear about it because church attendance, for example, is not that bad and uh, uh, there are uh, other uh, non-Christian religions where uh, uh, there is really no uh, lack of uh, devotes in, in, in the temples uh, and when we make general surveys although people are non-religious and they do not want to go to a temple and they do not identify as uh, this or that they still believe in, in, in a supreme intelligence or in the immortality of the soul uh, it, the, the numbers in the West, or in, in the 10 largest countries maybe, uh, except for China, where the surveys are not quite uh, realistic, because the, 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 they are sometimes uh, filtered, uh, 
uh, with, with the exception of China, in the 10 biggest countries, about 60% of the population believes in afterlife, in one form or another, but not exactly in the same uh, expressions of afterlife, but they believe in some sort of afterlife. Sometimes the media and uh, the way uh, we, we talk to people uh, on the streets uh, can communicate as a feeling, can give us a feeling that uh, we live in a completely irreligious era. But uh, it, it's not quite true. People are open to debate if the debate is established in, in proper terms. For example, we, we had a significant reaction in uh, this, this two or, or three weeks when, since the, the book was released we have a had a significant reaction from uh, the public around the world uh, and, and many people we would not expect to, uh, to, to make contact with, with us did um, and I, I think uh, if we avoid uh, traditional religious discourse, uh, which is really oriented to the believers of these specific traditions, and if we can address the subject in a very open uh, and, and, and frank debate, uh, people will be more open to, to, to consider the possibilities and will reveal that they have a tendency to admit at least the possibility, maybe not the, the conviction, but the possibility that uh, it could be a, a reasonable explanation for many aspects of life. Another question, was your research conclusive? It was not conclusive, it was suggestive. So uh, we cannot say, um, and maybe it would be unscientific to say we proved that the soul remains after the death of the body but the evidence is so suggestive that some great researchers such as the, the important uh, philosopher of science and skeptic uh, Robert Omida in the United States say well the evidence is so powerful and so compelling that it would be irrational not to believe in the survival of the spirit after the death of the, of the body so um, many researchers are uh, persuaded that the evidence is quite powerful and we also made a, a general analysis of the, the opposition or the criticism on the evidence and we did not find, find a, a single powerful argument against the evidence. Pretty much all claims and, and all criticism are based on materialistic presuppositions. So this cannot be true because science proved that only matter exists and, and hope there is no such thing as spirit and so and so. Yeah. However, um, quantum physics has already debunked matter, right? Has proven that uh, matter simply doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So how can they still insist on the on the theory or in the, mm -hmm. on the belief that? Uh, on something that doesn't exist it goes back to what um, people who believe in after death or mm -hmm. in um, surviving so that they cannot touch or yeah improve would mm -hmm. be pretty much the same wouldn't it yeah yes uh, science has developed in a certain way that renders uh, naive materialism yeah impossible nowadays it has been more and more difficult to to hold naive materialistic beliefs. So uh, the more sophisticated materialists started speaking about uh, emergentism, complex theories, and other ways to explain how uh, 
fundamental levels of, of physics do give birth to biology and how biology does give uh, space uh, to, to new layers of psychology and, and cognition that are hard to explain in, in uh, biologic, biological terms only. But I, I think the, the best uh, arguments against materialism are still philosophical arguments. We have a very recent book from uh, a British man, uh, Ian, Ian uh, McGilchrist, uh, entitled The Matter with Things. Uh, it, it's uh, an ironic uh, title because he kind of shows that uh, matter and things are not so strongly correlated. Uh, we, we have the, the general uh, myth in the modern world. Yeah, as, again, another example, uh, yeah, Elsa is showing matter. us the soul of matter. Soul of matter. Mm -hmm. So, we, we have many recent approaches on uh, the same fundamental problem uh, of describing uh, macroscopic objects and the objects of perception which are in themselves uh, objects that uh, are constituted by our perception and the way we deal with them and uh, this dependency on perception uh, is uh, already very well and exhaustively explored in philosophy from, from the idealists such as Schelling and, and Hegel to uh, phenomenology in the 20th century. And uh, Jan McGilchrist, uh, a neuroscientist, uh, creates a, a, a new possible interpretation of uh, the way our minds, our consciousness, produce objects in uh, the living experience, so to say. And the ob objects of our living experience do not quite correspond to matter in the naive sense depicted by uh, science education. Because good scientists do know that there are some gaps in uh, our description of reality. But in scientific education, we look to one of these glasses and we will explain them as just a, a net of molecules uh, as uh, a glass was nothing but an aggregate of molecules but in fact uh, nature produces no glasses glasses are human made mm -hmm. according to a purpose according to a design according to some uh, intelligent form. mind be behind <laughs> exactly there is a lot of mind in a simple glass in a simple piece of furniture, for example. It does not exist in nature. Triangles mm -hmm. do not exist in nature. Mm -hmm. We Behind measure you. everything <laughs> with them, but nevertheless, they are products of our uh, uh, conscious interpretation of reality. This is not to say that uh, reality is produced by our minds, but there are uh, uh, human bias or uh, cognitive bias in the way we understand reality and we have to take it in consideration. Well, wonderful though. Because it, it's so difficult to, to have a, a lecture né, with this kind of subject. Mm -hmm. Because always, always, always we have it, né, an arbor door to books, etc. Spiritism, that's good. Now we study this, but it's nice to have something new talking about you know the fundamentals of uh, philosophy and theology that you are bringing here. Mm -hmm. And also, you like to point that the book that you wrote, this new one, mm -hmm. is with Dr. Alexander Moreira yes, Almeida. The Science of Life After Death uh, by Springer. You can find it very easily online uh, on, on the e selling sh uh, shops and so. 
uh, and I, I wrote it with Mariana Costa and Alexander Moreira Almeida, which are both preeminent psychiatrists dedicated to uh, the scientific research on spirituality. Uh, I myself I am, I am a philosopher, but I am also engaged in research on the relationship between science and religion and in spirituality as well. Wonderful, no? Mm. Oh, I think Humberto would like to say thank you so much for your wonderful speech now in the formal time. Now I will off our camera, the live. Uh, I want people to share, please, this link because it's very important. And enjoy it and watch again as we will do, okay? Yeah. Uh, now I have to press. Uh, uh, yeah, just a minute, Jack. Let's put it off. Finish here.